Up next, we have Karen Roberts, and she is going to be doing a talk on physicians associates, who are they? Karen is a is the program director for physician associate studies at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. She will be taking a lead in a panel discussion about physicians associates. Right, I will leave it to you. Thanks very much, Daisy. Okay, so the question is physician associates, who are they? Um, and as Daisy said, I'm Karen Roberts. I am a physician associate myself. Uh, I sound a little bit different. So I trained in the United States and moved here in 2007 um, and was working full time in general practice. When I came, there were about 30 of us in total in the entire UK. And now we have about 2,500. So that growth has been absolutely fantastic and very exciting to watch the development of our profession in the UK. So this is what we're going to talk about today. What, what are we? Um, how do you become a PA? Why, why become a PA? And then what to think about when you're looking at universities and what universities are looking for in students. So the current definition of a PA is that we're a new healthcare professional. We are not doctors, but we work in the same way doctors do. So in the medical model. And we are trained in the very similar way to the way doctors are trained. And so we practice as part of the medical team. And we always work under supervision of one of our doctors. So that doesn't necessarily mean they are in the room with you. In fact, once you're qualified and experienced, they generally will not be in the room with you. You will be seeing patients and reporting to the doctor. So how do you become a PA? So first you need a life science degree. Okay, so that's biomedical science, human biology, something along those lines. Physiology is absolutely one of the key components that you need to have because that basically describes and will help you understand all the processes that go on and disease processes. Um, most PA programs in the UK do require a 2-1 as the minimum undergraduate degree. There are a few programs that will accept a 2-2, and this is for your undergraduate degree. Okay, you could have a master's or a PhD on top of that. They might um, have some allowance for that if you haven't earned at least a 2-2, but that would be on an individual program basis. Then if you're going to apply, you might want to consider volunteering. It's a little bit more challenging now in the COVID environment, but a lot of our students come to us or applicants come and they already work as healthcare assistants. So that's not even volunteering, that's getting a job as a healthcare assistant and having that direct patient experience. And that can help with the application. Some programs may even require that you have some experience in healthcare before you apply to the program. And then you really need to do your research on all the various programs that offer, um, or the universities that offer a PA program. And if you go to the Faculty of Physician Associates website um, and click on the Becoming a PA under the student, um, I think it's a student tab, there's a whole list of all the programs with links and you can just click on them and then read about the programs. So how are PAs and doctors different? We both practice medicine. Okay, I don't do anything other than practice medicine very similarly to the doctors with whom I work. And so if you look at a typical medical school in the UK, they're often five years. Students spend the first two years doing basic sciences, learning about medicine, about physiology and chemistry. And then the final three years of medical school are much more clinical. So they're on placement, they come back for some teaching. And what they cover in the five years is the breadth of medicine and also a lot of that to a very deep level. So it's breadth and depth. And after they finish at the end of the five years, they enter their foundation years. So they're still trainees and they're actually trainees for many years to come. PA students actually already come to us with a very solid life science background. So you have covered in the three years in your biomedical science degree, some of the content that's covered in the first two years of medical school, not all of it definitely, but you will have that good strong foundation. And then students come to us for our two years of PA studies, postgraduate entry. Now what's really important to say is we probably cover 80% of the medical school curriculum in two years. It is incredibly intense and we do cover the breadth of medicine. So that's across all systems. What varies from medical school is the depth. So things that are really, really common, we probably do those to the same level or a very similar level to the medical students. 
And we also focus on really common important conditions. So anything that is life, limb, or eyesight threatening, our students absolutely have to know those things. However, other things that are less rare, okay, we know it's out there, we know what to look for, but we're not managing those conditions. PAs absolutely focus on the common and important. And when we are done, we enter employment and we are done with formal education. We have to continue with regular annual updates, but we're, we're done with our training period. So why does the NHS need us? So first of all, we're adding to the skill mix and we're bringing new talent. So our whole medical team is fantastic and we have had nurses and paramedics and other allied health professions come into the PA role. But what's really important to say is those areas are already short. We don't have enough nurses. And so if we have a huge number of nurses who come from nursing into PA, then we're going to have even worse shortage in nursing. So most of the students who come in to the PA training programs actually come with a science background. So they are science graduates and that way we are adding new people to the NHS which is very very important. The other thing that is fairly unique to PAs is that we are generalists and no matter what specialty we work in we maintain that generalist knowledge and that's really important so I've always worked in general practice but I have a very strong interest in dermatology so if I ever left uh, the clinical world of general practice and wanted to change I could go get a job in dermatology without going back and doing a whole training program. So I just wanted to touch base again and say how condensed this program is. So you do your undergraduate, but starting this program is a completely different experience for students. Um, it is a, basically full time and then, and um, one of the second year students from Brighton is here and will join in the conversation at the end of the presentation. So people just need to be prepared when you start a PA program. It is very, very intense. So why choose a career? I did mention about this career flexibility. So we can move for the rest of our careers into another specialty. Um, so say you're in dermatology for five years and you think, okay, I've had enough of just dealing with skin and I'd actually like to go do something else. Maybe I'll move into trauma and orthopedics because I actually have an interest in surgical work. So you can do that as a PA. And then it's also, still at this point, the chance to be involved in something new. So yes, now we have 2,500 PAs in the UK, and that is really exciting. But still, 20 years from now, people who enter at this stage will be seen as pioneers. If we look at our work-life balance, okay, PA programs are tough, and actually you don't really have much of a social life at all when you are a PA student for those two years. But once you are done, you are not rotating around the country for years doing your training. You just settle into a job, um, and that work-life balance becomes much, much better. And it is an opportunity to practice medicine as part of the medical team alongside our doctors and provide excellent care to patients. If you don't care about the title, then this could absolutely be the role for you if what you really care about is providing excellent care. So where do we work? In the early days, it was really in the UK, just general practice and emergency medicine, but now we are in almost every single specialty. Um, as far as I know, no one working in palliative medicine yet, but almost everywhere else we have PAs working across the board and in all four nations. So how do we actually help? So I've talked about the skill mix, but it's also about improving training for our junior doctors. So if you can imagine there aren't enough people, someone has to take care of the patients on the wards. That means that the junior doctors often get trapped in that and can't be released for their training. So when you add a PA to the mix, then it actually makes life better for the junior doctors because they can then escape to do the training that they need to do. And it also provides great continuity. So you may hear people say that PAs are the glue that holds the team together. And that's because once a PA joins a team, we are there. We know how things work. We know how to get things done. We know where things are or who to ask for particular questions. The junior doctors come in, they're there for a few months and off they go to their next um, rotation in their training. And so the PAs actually become very, very skilled and very knowledgeable within their area of specialty, and that's really important. And then when patients come and go and they can see the same person every time, that is invaluable. 
we also can see a lot of patients. So my normal routine um, when I was working in general practice full time was a minimum of 31 appointments a day. And so that over over a week was 155 appointments. That's a lot of appointments for patients and really increases their access into services. The other thing it does is it allows doctors to focus on the more complex patients and, and potentially have longer appointments with them because I can see a lot of patients in the time that they could actually spend more focused time with a mo most complex patient. And the, the drawing is just to show that if we were all doing separate roles, so the PA and the adver advanced nurse practitioner and the doctor, if we all did separate roles and there was this tiny little triangle of overlap in the middle, then access to care isn't that great. But actually my entire scope of practice fits within the doctor's scope of practice. I'm offering the same services, maybe not 100% of the same service, but everything I offer is what the doctor also offers. And then the advanced nurse practitioner does some nursing and actually some medicine. And so if you see that ellipse shape where all three overlap, that's a huge amount of increased access to care for patients. Right, so switching gears here, what are universities looking for? Actually, they want you to have a very strong life science foundation. And I have seen many people, they've come from other professions as I did, and then want to become a PA and want to do it immediately. But these are very, very difficult courses and you need to give yourself the best chance if you're coming from something else. If you're going into undergraduate now, great, do as, you know, Focus on that healthcare, focus on biomedical sciences, physiology, biology, and get that strong foundation. If you are coming from another profession, my first degree is in German. I spent over two years doing science modules before I even applied to a program. The stronger you are and the stronger your foundation, if you are making a career change, the better your chance of success. If you want to just take one and think you're going to succeed when you're in, in modules that are so fast paced and you're sitting alongside science graduates, it will be a challenge. So it's really important to think that. And then what else are we looking for? We want people who are completely patient centered. Everything we do revolves around our patients. And so yes, I absolutely care about my students. I encourage them, I support them. But what I really am doing is I am creating strong clinicians and actually I care about every single patient my students will see in the future for the rest of their careers. So I have to do a good job making sure my students are as highly functioning as possible. Strong clinicians. You must be able to cope with the very stressful intensity of this program. So if you already have stress issues, does that mean you can't be a PA? Absolutely not. It does mean you can be a PA, but you have to be able to cope. And so it's having those coping mechanisms in place and knowing where to get support and being really open and honest with your program to say, I've struggled with this in the past and you know, I, I just need to support and I will let you know when I'm feeling like I'm going under. That's really important. Really strong communication skills, both verbally and, and written, because if you write something in a chart note and the next clinician to read it doesn't understand what you're talking about, patient safety is at risk. And then really understanding the profession. When I see an application that comes and says, I've always wanted to be a doctor, I'm like, okay, then please go to medical school. That's great. This is not a wannabe profession. This is not second cho choice. People choose to be a, a PA for the many things that our profession offers. So last takeaway thoughts, actually we are here to help provide care for our patients and we aren't taking jobs away from anybody. I've never seen, you know, a clinician or any, uh, anyone from the medical team or administrative team standing on the, uh, standing out on the pavement, holding up a sign saying, please come in. We don't have enough work to do. There's so much work to do in the NHS and we need more clinicians. And so it's really important that we um, grow this profession. And I'm going to stop sharing now. And if we can get Lior to join, that would be great. Hello. And we'll answer any questions. If there are any. Okay, so Priya, 
it's, there's a question, what is a PA? So physician associate, and um, if you want more information, if you go to the Faculty of Physician Associate website, um, that would be a great place to start to get some more um, information. And Lior, do you want to talk just for a couple minutes about what it's like to be a yeah. PA student since you are? So Lior is a second year PA, PA um, student. Yeah, um, it's um, it's an intense um, couple of years. I'm I'm kind of a third or so through the second year from a background of biomedical science. Um, it yeah, it takes a lot of organisation and focus, um, but it's also very rewarding. You know, if you if you've had in your head for a while, which a lot of people have, that they want to work um, within medicine, um, then I think for a lot of people, it feels um, very satisfying to start learning all of this really interesting stuff, which is very practical, very real life. Um, and the fact that um, most programs um, you get um, patient experience quite early on, not all programs, but um, I would recommend programs that do um, that's that keeps you motivated because you can apply what you're learning re to real life yeah great someone asked about the timetable and really in most programs you need to plan on at least nine to five and that's sort of your learning so our students i think our schedule at brighton tends to be about nine to four most days but then students go home and they spend hours preparing and revising. And so it is it is more really than a full time job. It is completely different than the undergraduate um, timetable. We are our students are doing activities five days a week. So we see them physically or we see them for teaching blended approach this year. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and they're in general practice placement um, on Thursdays. And so, and that started really in the first month of the program. And so it is a very, very full-time schedule. Let's make sure I didn't miss any questions further up. Grades, timetable, differences between a PA and advanced nurse practitioner. So I think the main difference is our students start from day one learning in the medical model. Okay, so they're learning the breadth of medicine, how to take histories, um, develop differential diagnoses, investigations, basically practicing medicine from day one. And our ad advanced nurse practitioners are amazing. And they, so they've done nursing first, and then they add on the bits to practice medicine that they didn't have. So they may not have had diagnostic um, or clinical reasoning and those skills get added on. Um, and in the end, if you have a really an advanced nurse practice, practitioner and a PA working side by side, they often are very equivalent. Sometimes um, the advanced nurse practitioners may train in a specific specialty and so they may not have across the breadth of medicine. So that could be a difference, but there are all sorts of different advanced nurse practitioners and some do do the breadth and some do specialty, whereas all PAs train across the breadth of medicine. Okay. Any other questions? So GCSEs, you need to be aiming for well, every program is different, so I would go look at, for the requirements, but usually they do require high grades, um, at least A through C, or I'm not sure what they're called now, but um, in maths and English. But you need to look at the requirements for each program. I don't know if you agree, Karen, but if you're at, your le at the level of doing GCSEs at the moment, it's, it's more about a focus on trying to get your onto the undergraduate program that you need in order to do the PA program because all PA or most PA programs are postgraduate so they're master level so you just need to make sure you get onto a biomedical science degree or a physiology degree um, and in which case you need to check their requirements. And there aren't any specific A-levels. It's really about your undergraduate degree. Your undergraduate degree needs to be a life science. So biomedical science is an excellent preparation. Physiology, human physiology would be an excellent preparation. 
human biology would be great preparation. So those are really the things we're looking for. Um, it has to be a life science degree or you, some universities will consider a non-life science degree, but with a lot of modules. So as I said, I have a degree in German. I had to do about two years worth of university level um, modules before I could even apply to my PA program. And are there opportunities to be involved in research and teaching when qualified? Absolutely. So um, I've been in PA education for a long time. I had a graduate who came already with a PhD in sort of cardiology related field, um, graduated and immediately very first post was a 50-50 split post between cardiology clinical and cardiology research post. So you can absolutely be involved in that. And we love having our graduates come back and teach. And in fact, you know, as soon as they graduate, they can come help out with our clinical skills teaching because they've just come from the program and their clinical exam skills are fantastic. Um, we do always try to get PAs involved in the teaching. So once they're out there and a bit more experienced, we have them come and deliver lectures and become part of our teaching staff. It's very important. Um, can you have a part-time job? I mean, the reality is students do have part-time jobs, some of them, but you risk um, do you know doing less well but you know if you are super um, good at time management and you can manage your time really well so that you know when you're working and you protect your learning time you can't miss class so it does it does um, it is possible but it does make it harder and so what I often have the conversation is work as hard as you can save up every penny and try not to work or work as little as possible during during your training because it will impact, it can impact your ability to get through the program. But students do it, you know, it's, it's, you will have already had an undergraduate degree, their debts, you know, the reality is a lot of students do work part time. It's also about, you know, managing your, your free as well. You know, you can't, you can't work all of the time that you have free, you know, you need to have some time for yourself. And um, that's really, really important. Um, so if, you, if you're going into the degree needing to work every hour that you're not at university, then you might want to consider saving for a year to give you that extra space um, because you really do need to have at least a day or two a week where you can just do whatever it is that you want to do, whether you like to go swimming, like to garden, whatever it is you want to do. Um, it's really important. Okay. And then Adana had a question about failing at the end of the two years. So these are postgraduate courses and courses must abide by their university regulations. So for most postgraduate courses, there is a limit of two attempts at every assessment. So you have a sit and a resit and then that's it. Um, so that there are a limited number, but that would be again by each university. And, but that does tend to be a, a fairly standard postgraduate um, regulation. So programs can't just decide on their own to go against the regulations of the university. So, but yes, that is. And then after graduation, we have a national exam. So students come through their universities, they pass the university exams, they graduate, and then you have to sit our national basically licensing exam, which is both a written exam and a clinical exam. And you have currently three attempts on each of those components, but it, that is after you graduate from your program. It's a licensing exam, and if you don't know, that is coming in for medicine as well within the next few years. Any other questions? It's, it's about the preparation. Leo, do you want to talk about some of the placements you've been on or any, you know, specific things that you found? I mean, I, 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 I'm, at, I'm at Brighton and at Brighton we do, from year one, we spend one day a week in GP pretty early on, which basically means that, <clears throat> you know, if we're learning about respiratory conditions one week, um, you then have an opportunity to go into your GP practice that week and, you know, really take note of the patients that are coming in. Um, so you get to apply your knowledge straight away. And that's, you know, this is, it's a vocational degree. You know, we're not, we're not just learning lots of facts. We're learning some, you know, something that needs to be applied to real patients. So, 
um, in a program like at, at Brighton, we get we get in front of patients straight away. And I think that's the most important part of this is um, realizing that at the end of this, you're learning how to do a job. This isn't this isn't doing a master's just to have a master's. This is learning how to do a job. Um, that's yeah. Great. I hope you all have found that useful. I'm, and as I said, if you go to the Faculty of Physician Associates website, um, you can find quite a bit of information there. Um, there are lots of different tabs you can look at. And just a reminder that PAs work in any specialty. So once you qualify, it's about finding the job that you think is the best fit for you. And then always having the ability to change, change specialties throughout the rest of your career. And just want to reiterate what Karen also said earlier is about PA not being second to being a doctor. I think it's really, really important not only to get onto the course because courses won't let you in if they think that you're doing it as a as a you know second option, but you know really have in your head why you want to do PA. You know if you just think it's going to be easier than getting into medicine, then mostly you're wrong because the criteria tends to be very similar. Um, and secondly, they're just they're dif they're different, um, different lifestyle, different course, different um, training. Um, so I think really consider why you want to do PA and not medicine, and why you want to maybe do medicine and not PA, um, because it's a very different lifestyle. Um, and as Karen said, you know, doctors, the training doesn't finish at the end of the five years; it goes on and on. Um, and if that suits you, then that's great and you should do medicine. But if you want to do two years um, and develop in your own time throughout your career, because we are, we will be lifelong learners as well, um, then maybe PA is for you. And if you're not so worried about the title of doctor, again, PA might be more suited to you. So I think just really consider that. Yeah. And someone said, can it be a portfolio career? I guess, what's your definition of a portfolio career? Can you work in different specialties? Yes, you can. Do you have to go back and do uh, a training period? No, you come into the team and the team and your consultants or your supervisor, whether you go into GP, um, will help develop you in the areas that you are less familiar with. But because we take an exam actually every six years, a generalist exam to demonstrate that we are still safe and competent across the board. Our knowledge in any one area is never more than six years old because we actually um, revise for that exam and prepare for that. What are our working hours? Yes, yeah, similar to doctors, although most PAs don't work overnight shifts that some do. So don't think you're going to be excluded from that if you work as a PA. Um, but yes, in general practice, we, you know, we work pretty much the same hours that the GPs work and same in secondary care. You'll be on a shift pattern as part of the medical team and, and PAs pick up that. But it's the training period. You know, doctors, after they come out of their medical school programs, are in a training programs for years. Whereas we, when we finish our program, we just start to work and they are working. Yes, but they are still working in trainee capacity, whereas we are fully qualified. So we have someone say it's a very busy life. And I think whether that's from a PA, that's fantastic. It, it is a busy life, but actually it's so rewarding. I mean, being a PA is absolutely the best decision I made. I love being a PA. Um, and I think most uh, PAs, the job satisfaction amongst PAs is is very high. Yes, we're we are definitely going through a stressful period, but that applies to all healthcare clinicians. In fact, that applies to the entire population at the moment. Um, but yes, PAs are very very happy being PAs. Um, why is it their training programs take longer? Is that is that referring to medical school or I'm I'm not. If it's referring to a doctor, it's because they're becoming doctors. That's why it takes longer. They have to know things to a much, much deeper level than we do. It's not that our knowledge is superficial, but it and it becomes very strong in the in the area where we work. Um, but we are focusing on the most common and important conditions, and they have they have. 
they must have significant depth in their areas. Any other questions that are coming in? Yep, so showing the slide with the difference, you mean in the training period? Syra, happy to show that again. Let me just get back to that slide. Okay, I, let's see if it goes. Can you see that or no? Doesn't look like it. Um, we can't see anything yet. Daisy, that's not showing up moment I don't know I'll, I'll answer um, Adana's question <clears throat> I would say um, it's the pace of the degree that makes it difficult um, I think the content isn't necessarily um, the most complex um, especially if you're coming from a degree like biomedical science I think in your first degree you'll learn a lot of the really conceptual difficult molecular biology content which is very challenging um, of course it depends on the individual but I would say it's just the pace of the degree really I don't think there's lots of things that are going to really really hurt your brain to understand there are a few things but yeah I would say it's the, the pace and just there's a lot to get through and I think that's the same also for for medicine to be honest would you agree, Karen? I would agree. I would absolutely agree. And and there are people, in fact, one of our faculty members um, is a doctor and she says that she absolutely believes that the PA program is harder than medical school because of the intensity. It is not the content, it is the intensity um, and the pace. The fact that we're doing so much um, in, in, there we go, there's that slide, that we're doing so much in a brief period of time you know, sort of 80% of the content of medical school in 40% of the time, that's a huge ask for students. Can it be done? Absolutely. You know, obviously we have 2,500 roughly qualified PAs in this country who have demonstrated that it absolutely can be done. Okay, so I think this is the slide um, that Zyra wanted to see, and this is comparing, comparing the training of medical school and PA studies together. And you can see that you know, in medical school, most programs in this country are five years and they do spend most of the first two years really focused on clinical basic sciences and they're not much of the time um, out on placement. And then in the final three years, they spend, I would say, most of their time on placement coming back in for more training. And then when they're done with that, they enter into their foundation year. So junior doctor foundation one foundation two and and going on from there pa studies our students already come so that first three-year block that's not within our program that's your undergraduate degree in life sciences okay and then comes the two-year pa program and because our terms are also longer so undergraduate tends to be about 30 weeks a year pa programs are a minimum of 45 weeks per year so in two years, we're doing 90 weeks minimum, whereas in two years, sometimes in undergraduate, you're only doing 60. So you can see that it is much longer and very intense. And then when we're done, we just get our first job and we're there basically providing that continuity of care for the team and the patients. Is that helpful?
great. I'm going to stop sharing again if that's glad we managed to get that going again. All right, I would just repeat, if you are going to um, consider this as a, as a profession, that you do your research about the PA programs. Um, if they have open events, you should go ask smart questions. What is their weekly timetable like? Um, how much of their um, education program is self-directed learning? And how much is um, involved with faculty members and with facilitators because actually you're paying quite a bit of money. Um, it's difficult to teach yourself medicine in two years. So it's really important that you have contact with the facilitators. Um, what is the structure? So some people like problem-based learning and like more independent. Some people like to have lecture. Um, ideally, there's a combination of those ask how their graduates have done on the PA national exam. So these are really important questions. You want as the strongest program. Um, and, you know, this is, it is more than a full-time job, really. You are dedicating two years of your life to being the best clinician you can. And it's really important for your future patients. Okay, not just for you, but also for your future patients. Um, do you get to work continuous, continuously between doctors and physicians? Um, so that's, it's an interesting question. So in this country, physicians are hospitalist doctors, right? And GPs work in general practice. They're all doctors. Okay, so I haven't distinguished between them. The reason why the term in the United States is physician assistant, because all doctors are classified as physicians, whether they are surgeons or hospitalist doctors or GPs. They're all called physicians, and that is where the title arose in the US. It doesn't quite work as well here because physicians are, are, are hospitalist doctors who aren't surgeons, but we've kept the title just to be consistent with much of the perhaps, rest of the world. Um, as I remember, between doctors and physician associates, I'm not, I'm not sure. Not sure, Zara, if that didn't answer your question, go ahead and clarify exactly what you meant. But the, if that is what you meant, you know, the physician associates, um, physician associates and doctors making the whole medical team, um, you would be working with each of them equally. And then Neve had a question of how the role might develop. So um, if you don't know, currently we're not regulated. We've been working on that for 15 years and next year it's going to happen. Um, it was decided that the GMC, the General Medical Council, will be our regulator and that's going to happen from next fall. So the GMC currently only regulates doctors and now they're going to be regulating PAs as well as well as anesthetic associates um, and grouped together were called medical associate practitioners. So that's going to happen. That is hugely important. So we will be officially regulated and we will be on a register just like doctors are. And then prescribing is the next big thing that, that we're working on as a profession. So currently we cannot prescribe and we can't request ionizing radiation. That means x-ray, CT, and some MRIs. And the reason for that is it's a prescription. So those things will be changing. Um, the imaging requests will probably change from next year and prescribing is already underway. We cannot do it yet. It is illegal. It's not that we don't have the knowledge, but it's that we don't have the legal ability. So that's what I think is going to be the biggest change over the next few years. First regulation and second prescribing. Um, so those are very exciting for us. So, okay, so working between doctors. So, for example, so I work, as I said, in general practice. I had my own consultation room. I saw my own list of 31 patients a day minimum. I went and spoke with the doctors as I needed to, but that's not what happens on day one. When I first started as a PA, I had lots and lots and lots of questions. And so, but I could go ask any of the doctors. And so it, it just depends on how the GP surgery um, has it set up. They might have a duty out duty doctor every day who's handling all the, you know, a bunch of acute calls. And that person is the support, the supervisor on the day for the PAs if they have any questions or need any assistance. 
In secondary care, a lot of the teams already are very consultant-led. So if you, for example, work in neurology, the neurologist consultant is going to be the person who is in charge of everybody else in the healthcare team, including all of the junior doctors. So even if it's the registrar, the top person is the consultant and everybody will be um, in essence reporting to the consultant. As a PA, you may be working alongside one of the registrars, but in the end, it's the consultant who has the final word for everybody. Um, it's up to you. If you become a PA, you can work in GP, you can work in hospital, you can change, you can do both. I've had graduates work part-time in general practice and part-time in emergency medicine and just split their week between the two or alternate weeks and it's a good mix. So it, it just depends on what you want to do when you qualify and where those jobs are. Then what placements have you been on so far this year? So Lior just started second year at the at the beginning of August or the middle of August. Um, and so you've had yeah. what, three or <clears throat> four I've had respiratory placements medicine, now? elderly medicine, acute medicine, um, and then throughout year one GP. And I'm due to start cardiology very soon. Um, so we spend about three, four weeks in each placement in the second year rotating around. Um, which gives us a really good idea about one where you might want to work when you qualify and also just gives you that background in each of them areas so even if you do go to gp you're getting all of the experience to see the extreme versions of each of these illness so when an illness takes somebody to hospital um, you can recognize that in gp um, but wherever you work it's good to have that that exposure Um, can being a PA be a lifetime career? Absolutely. Most PAs are. They wouldn't, I mean, I've had PAs say, if somebody put a piece of paper in front of me and all I had to do to be a doctor is um, sign the piece of paper, I wouldn't because being a PA is who I am. And that was from a, a graduate of mine who, you know, being a PA is, it almost is in every cell of your body, really. Um, and it is a lifetime career. If you look in the United States, PAs, um, the profession started in 1965. The first three PAs graduated in 1967. There have been since then over 160,000 PAs graduate, and it's always one of the top three master's degrees you can earn. Um, and it is a lifetime career. There are PAs who have been PAs for decades. And so it's, it, it is a, an incredibly rewarding profession that you can do in a relatively short period of time, you are not going to be an expert on day one of your first job. So that takes time, but you embed in the team. And because the course is so intense, I think most PAs, when they qualify, really ramp up and climb that steep first year learning curve pretty quickly because we are used to the fast pace of the course. And so it doesn't take long before we're really effective members of our teams. I'm glad you guys feel motivation. I'm motivated every single day. And I usually come into meetings and, you know, someone, someone asked me to come speak about PAs. I say, okay, but let me know because I love it. I can talk nonstop about PAs. Um, and I just think it's an amazing profession. And I always wanted to live in the UK. And um, the first trial of PAs in the UK happened while I was a student. And, um, I was so excited. I almost came and did a placement with my um, here in GP. I was going to live with my in-laws and then that fell through. But trust me, as soon as I graduated, I got some experience and then I was applying for jobs here. Um, and I think it's been hugely motivating and rewarding to see how the profession has grown um, in the UK. So I can work in, the, yes, so I did train in the U.S. and then I came here. And that's because in the beginning, there were no PAs here. And so we had to bring experienced U.S. PAs into the U.K. to demonstrate that the role would work. I came a little bit after those first trials. The first trials ran sort of 2003, 2004, and I came in 2007. But it is not, there is no reciprocity worldwide for PAs. So I speak fluent German. 
I cannot go work in Germany as a PA, even though I speak fluent German because I didn't train there. And so there's no reciprocity. I think that might ease a bit over the next few decades. But at the moment, most PAs cannot go work as PAs in other countries. If US PAs want to work in Canada, they have to actually take the Canadian exam to work there. And I think that will become true here. I think that um, we will have anyone coming from outside the UK in future who is allowed to work here will have to sit the UK exam. Um, the course is somewhat similar. It's not exactly the same as it is in the US. They are much more intense. They tend to have exams every two to three weeks in almost every, and those are summative exams in almost every PA program, whereas ours tend to be at the end of the year. Um, the hours are different, so they have to have more clinical hours um, than is required by our um, documentation, our requirements and education, but they are similar. And they're, in my opinion, you know, our strong UK grads are, are, you know, they stand head and shoulders, you know, same, same with the USPAs. How many, how often would you have exams? So if you enter, if you get into a program, Zyra, you would have the, the program exams at whatever program you attend. Um, for most programs, it's exams at the end of year one and then at the end of year two. Um, our program has a written exam and this clinical exam called an OSCE um, at the end of both years. They also write a master's um, dissertation, which is a service improvement project, so it actually can have positive outcomes for a service where they have been on placement. Um, other programs have other types of exams like pharmacology or the, it just depends on the structure of the program. So these are questions you would ask. Uh, and then once you come through the program, then we have a national exam that is written exam and the clinical exam. So it's your program exams and then it's your licensing exam. And as I said, that is coming in for doctors in this country. So currently they only have their program exams, but in future there will also be a licensing exam for doctors in the UK. Uh, when I first moved to the UK, I did not have to sit the UK exam because it was made up of from the US exam questions. Now that has since changed and they are all UK generated questions. Um, but no, because I had to maintain my US certification um, and that's what that dash C means at the end of my PA dash C. So I still maintain my US certification, but I'm also on the UK register. So that's my dash R. Um, so I didn't have to sit the UK exam and currently still US PAs do not, but th that will be changing and I imagine that will be changing soon. Um, but I did work straight away and there were differences in prescribing. You know, I was a full prescriber in the US. Not every state has full prescribing for PAs, but mine did. Um, and so for me, it was about learning the differences in medications, even though I couldn't prescribe, it's part of my management plan for my patients. So I still have to have that strong pharmacology knowledge, but I cannot sign prescriptions. It, that is illegal in this country, completely illegal. And so that has, I've obviously never done that since I moved here. I might suggest medications, um, but I would never sign them. It's illegal. But that will change. Other questions? So in total, how long all together to be an employed PA? Right, so you've got your three years, if you're about to do undergrad or you're in undergrad now, so you've got your three year undergraduate degree and then two years of um, the PA program 
and then following that you you sit the next national exam so your training in total is five years so three undergrad and two pa and then you have to sit your exams and most people do that within sort of the first two months after they finish their program but two years in education uh, sorry three three years undergraduate two years postgraduate education so again so the the question about international reciprocity or working in the u.s it has to do with the u.s regulator it has nothing to do with us in the uk saying you can't do that it is because to work as a pa in the u.s you have to pass the u.s licensing exam Okay, that, that's called the PA National Certification Exam. You can only enter that exam if you have come from a program that is accredited by the Accreditation Review Council for PA Programs, that's ARC PA in the US, and they only accredit US PA programs. They're very busy accrediting and reviewing on an ongoing basis the current, I think, 260 programs, and there'll soon be over 300 programs in the US. And so they don't know anything about our laws here. We practice medicine here. Our laws are different in this country. And so there is no need for them to go accredit programs that are outside of the US because they're busy with US programs and there are something like 10,000 USPAs qualifying every year. So they, there's no need for them to accredit programs outside and they wouldn't understand our laws in the UK. Well, it's not that they wouldn't understand, but they don't need to be up to date on non-US laws. Okay, and so that's why we can't go or UK graduates cannot go work there. If you want to work in the US, you must apply to and attend and pass a USPA program and then pass the US national exam. Um, so you don't work with studying, you are on placement, um, but that is not paid placement. So a few students do work part time to help support their program, but, but that does take time away from study. So you do have to be very organized about it, but placements are not paid placements. Um, after completing a degree in physiotherapy, so yes, and I would say the physiotherapy, so it's it's really important to make sure you're getting some physiology modules. So just, you know, the MSK portion of the degree, musculoskeletal portion of the degree isn't quite enough, but if within the physiotherapy program, you're doing some general physiology, then yes, that's absolutely um, a, a good, a good, preparation for coming into a PA program. And when you get to the musculoskeletal section, you'll be very well uh, prepared for that. So if you're considering doing psychology, for most programs, psychology isn't quite enough if it's a social science, because psychology is a social science degree, not a life science degree. So again, I love having psychology graduates on the program. They are a great asset. However, you do need to have um, that, that physiology. So make sure if you have any optional modules you can take and physiology um, is there, you definitely need that in an undergraduate psychology degree. Can you work in other countries after being employed? So again, it is about the regulation in the other countries. It has nothing to do with the P UK telling you, you can't go work there. So if you want to work in Australia or Canada, so Canada at the moment only allows graduates from the US to take their exam, no other countries. Australia, um, so not all countries have PAs or have any regulation for PAs. They're just starting to have um, work on regulation documents in New Zealand. Um, and so you would have to go to those countries um, and do research on whether or not they would accept UK trained PAs. But as of right now, there is no international reciprocity at all. Uh, when you get paid, so after the two years and the exam, will you get paid? Yes, yes, once you, once you qualify and you pass the national exam, uh, you are a qualified PA, you get a job and you get paid, absolutely. You do not have to, well, you can volunteer and your time, well but you well, are going is, into paid nice. employment. It's a lot of work and you get rewarded and, for it.
Um, yes, in the U.S. is it postgraduate? Uh, I, I think out of the 250 programs, there might be three, maybe, that are undergraduate entry, so they're four-year uh, or five-year, because most undergraduate programs in the U.S. are four-year programs, so we don't do three-year three -year bachelor's degrees. We do four-year bachelor's degrees, So, um, and then they add on a year, so I think they're five-year undergraduate. Um, and very expensive. But the vast, vast majority are postgraduate. And you have to take a number of exams. So the, the usually the postgraduate record, the GRE, the graduate record exam. Um, do you get paid a lot after employment? So it's band for the most part, PAs start on agenda for change band seven. So it's starting in the sort of mid to upper thirty thousand range some a bit higher and it depends if you're in an area where there's a cost of living addition on that great these are some great questions I think we've got about five more minutes. Um, just in case you have any last minute questions, the best undergraduate degree, yes, biomedical science and physiology, hands down, are the best preparation for the PA program because you're going to be learning so much and and without that strong foundation in physiology and biomedical science, it's it's challenging to succeed. As I said, it's not impossible, and I'm an example, but I did spend two years um, doing nothing but life science um, modules. I just enrolled in a university and did life science modules um, to prepare to even apply. I couldn't even have, have applied to my program without, without you know, genetics and chemistry and biology. So just go look at your programs. Um, it's different in the US, there's very specific um, programs. How competitive is it applying in any tips? So yes, it again depends on the program. So I would say at Brighton this year, for our students who just started, we had over 150 applicants for 20 spots. And we interviewed just over half of the applicants. So just over, I don't know, maybe it was 80, might have been 90, but it was over half, but not two thirds. Um, uh, and again, only 20, well, we actually made one extra offer. So we had 21 offers. Um, so, yeah. And so other, you know, there are larger programs than Brighton. There are smaller programs than Brighton. And so, you know, it's about finding what's near to you or which is the best program you want to apply. Um, and some are very, very, very competitive. So it's about knowing why you want to be a PA, writing an excellent um, personal statement, paying attention to what the personal statement is actually asking if they ask specific questions, okay? And knowing why you want to be a PA. You need to research it. And I would encourage you not to write physicians associate in your application. <laughs> Because there's no S at the I end of position in our title. Earlier, Go ahead, Leora, you were going to say something. <clears throat> you know, not all programs are created equal. Um, and some some are in their very early days of establishing themselves. So I, I really would just try and get into the, the best university that you can you can get into. And if you feel you need a little bit more time to work on your application, then, then just do that. Um, because you want to give yourself the best chance to succeed and the degree but also when you finish the degree you need to then be able to pass the national exam and um, some programs will prepare you better than others um, so just do your research you know see about you know look at the reputation of where you want to go um, and you know if you need to take it another year it's only a year you know use that year to get more work experience save some money you know the more money you can bank when you before you start the course the better there's no rush you don't need to you know get onto it as soon as possible um so just take the time get all the experience and money you can beforehand and do your research excellent advice 
um, can you get a student loan for PA? So at the moment, well, I can't tell what's going to happen in three years if you're just about to, you know, if you're in, in your first year. At the moment, for programs in England, Health Education England is offering a £5,000 training grant across the two years, but that only started two years ago and was only supposed to run for two years. They have stated that it's going to continue for next year, next year's entry, but we don't know beyond that. Um, the government also has a postgraduate um, loan scheme. It's £10,000 total. So that, you know, that would just about cover one year's tuition, but doesn't help with um, other costs of living and traveling to placement, right? So students travel quite far. One of our year one students is going two hours on the train each way um, because that's where the placement is. It's an excellent placement, um, but it is a bit of a journey and there's no funding to help with that. So it is about being prepared for the time and the costs and um, the commitment. It takes full commitment to do this, but it's short term. I didn't watch television for three years. I know I tell my students that and they don't believe me. I literally did not watch television for three years when I was training to be a PA because there was no time. Um, it was full on for three years my program was. so. Um, but again, it is the best career. And by the time you reach the end, it you look back and you think, that was so fast. I can't believe how fast that was. Um, you, you almost blink and it's gone. Um, it, it's tough, but it's rewarding and best, best career ever. <laughs> All right. Yes. I think Thank Daisy's so coming in to tell us our time really is up. And it seemed like everyone else got a lot, got a lot out of it. Um, yeah. So, yep. Well, thank, thank you all for joining. It's you know clearly I love it. Lior has been fantastic, and really appreciate him joining in mm -hmm. and thank talking you again. about the student perspective. Bye. All right. Thank you.